So the next fundamental doctrine of the Bible, brethren, that God's church bases its belief upon is the uh, subject of being born, born again. As you know, in the world around us, people, especially of the Protestant denominations, believe that they are now born again. However, the Bible reveals differently. We are going to review now the scriptures which, say, which shows us that no, we are not now born again. Now we are only begotten, but you know we will be born again indeed at Jesus Christ's return. We will also read the scriptures that tell us that uh, it there is a wrong translation. It should read begotten, not born again. But also in John chapter 3, uh, we know from the con conversation from Jesus Christ and Nicodemus that we need to be born again. And what state we will be then when we are born again, we'll read a couple of scriptures again from the uh, pen, penned by the Apostle John. Now, we also know that Christ is the firstborn. He is right now the firstborn among many brethren. We'll review those scriptures. Uh, how are we to be born again? There is one scripture in Romans. And when? Of course, at Christ's return, when will we be born again? So we are going to review those scriptures. First of all, as I said, let's see the one that says that, you know, we are not now born again. Uh, considering that, we need to go to the book of Romans. And go to chapter 7, of course. As you know, that's the uh, baptism chapter, which shows, again, also that, no, we are uh, not uh, born again right now. So, in the book of Romans, in chapter 7, we will start in verse 14. Romans seven fourteen. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not, for what I would, that I do not, but what I hate, that is what I do. If then I do which do which is I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. I'm reading a little bit from the uh, old King James, just to remind us of <laughs> that version. It's, you know, sometimes it's good to kind of review good old versions. So perhaps it's not as... Uh, as uh, as understandable so let's go to standard version perhaps you'll find it more understandable uh, verse 17 for so now it is no more i that do it but sin which dwells in me for i know that in me that is in my flesh dwells no good thing for to will is present with me but to do that which is good is not well, but in, which shows altogether that we are not born again now, because when we are born again, we'll be in the sinless state of being, you see. Verse 19, Romans 7, For the good which I would not, which I, I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I practice. But if what I would not, that I do, it is no more I that do it, but sin which dwells in me. So as long as sin is there, we are not born again. I find then the law... That to me who would do good, evil is present. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see a different law in mine is in my members. Well, you see, brethren, when we are, once we are born again, there'll be no that different law anymore. Warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity under the law of sin, which is in my members. Wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me out of the body of this death? So as long as we're in this body of this death, we are not born again. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so then I, my, I myself, I of myself, with the mind indeed serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. So that is in Romans chapter 7. Then also in Romans chapter 8, we have a couple of verses that again prove the point, brethren, that we are not born again now, because those who are born again, like Jesus Christ is the firstborn among many brethren, he is sinless, he cannot sin. He, of course could sin when he was in the flesh. He was tempted in all points as we are, but he did not sin. So he can empathize with our sufferings and our weaknesses, but no, he did not sin. And uh, now in this state of being, you know, being in a spiritual, in spiritual body, no, he cannot sin. This is exactly what is awaiting for us. So being born again means that we will not will to sin and we will not sin anymore. In chapter 8 of Romans and in verses 18 and 19, this point is also underlined, you see, because it speaks about the future glory. Romans 8, 18, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed to us. 
well, you see, it's in the future tense, which shall be revealed. For the earnest expectation of the creation waits for the revealing of the sons of God. So it is still in the future. It's still, you know, it's still waiting. The whole creation travails in, in, in pain, waiting for the sons of God and daughters of God to be born again, you know. In the meantime, the whole creation, as you will all know, brethren, from Romans, again, chapter 1, the whole creation is subjected to uh, death. It, you know, it decays, it perishes, and then, you know, it meets the death. Then in the book of Hebrews, chapter 1, there is one verse that also tells us that, no, we are not born again now. Hebrews chapter 1, and in verse, we'll read both verses. He says, God having of old time spoken unto the fathers in the prophets, in the prophets by diverse portions and in diverse manners, has at the, t the end of these days spoken unto us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. So his Son is the heir of all things, and we, as you, we know, we are the co-heirs. His son inherited the eternal life already and is now in glorified state. He is now again, you know, he is born again, but we are still not, you know. So therefore, we are still waiting for the state when we will be born again. And then now let's read in uh, the first book of John. There will be s several verses that underline again the point that no, we are not born again at this present time. First John chapter 1, 1 John chapter 1 and verse 8, it says, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Well, you see, brethren, when we are born again, there will be no sin. So again, this just underlines the same point. If we, verse 9, confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So, you know, very clear point again. No, we are not born again. We cannot be born again and have sin dwelling in our members and tempting us to sin. Also in First John chapter 3, and in verse 9, exactly, we see the same point. No, we are not born again, which says, verse 3, uh, chapter 3, verse 9, first John, whosoever is begotten of God, that's the true translation, not born of God, you see, right? And whosoever, I'm reading from American Standard Version, whosoever is begotten of God does not know sin because his seed abides in him and he cannot sin because he is begotten of God. The word is very begotten, is very good, you know, it's a, it's a good word. Now, of course, we can sin still, but, you know, we know that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. So we no longer are, you know, slaves unto sin. But whosoever is begotten of God, you know, does avoid sin, does all that he or she can, you know, to exterminate sin from his or her life. That's why we keep the days of unleavened bread to drive the point, that very holiday drives the point and reminds us of our need to put sin out completely out of our minds and our lives. And also in First John, uh, in chapter 2, the whole chapter 2 is in fact very relevant and because it speaks about Christ our advocate. Why why do we need advocate, brethren? Well, because why? Because we sin. So, chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, these things write I unto you, that you may not sin. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. And hereby we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He that says, I know him and keeps not his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But who, whosoever keeps his word, in him verily has the love of God been perfected. Hereby we know that we are in him. He that says he abides in him ought himself also to walk even as he walked. In other words, to live as he lived. 
Verse 7, Beloved, no new commandment write I unto you, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you heard. Again, a new commandment write I unto you, which is which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away, and the true light already shines. He that says he is in the light and hates his brother he is in the darkness even until now. He that loves his brother abides in the light and there is no occasion of, of stumbling in him. But he that hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and knows not whither he goes because the darkness has blinded his eyes. I write unto you, my little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I write unto you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write unto you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I have written unto you, little children, because you know the Father. I have written unto you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I have written unto you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. And then, throughout the rest of the chapter, he speaks about do not love the world. In any case, we are still in the world, and we are still of flesh and blood, and brethren, we still have the advocate in heaven, because, yes, we can still stumble and sin. So, as we have said, we are now begotten. So we are not born again, but we are begotten. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, we have this proof that we are now begotten. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. And I think that should be verse, it should be verse 5, I think. No, it should be verse 15. So it's 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 15. And it says, For though you have 10,000 tutors in Christ, yet have you not many fathers? For in Christ Jesus, I beget you through the gospel. So it doesn't say I, you know, made you born again or pushed you to be born again. No, I just beget you. Uh, the Apostle Paul says, I beget you through the gospel. Indeed. And also in Hebrews again, chapter 1, but this time in verse 5, we also have this assurance that uh, we are now begotten. It says, Hebrews 1, 5, for unto which of the angels did he say at any time, You are my son, this day have I begotten you. And again, I'll be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. So we are now in the state of being begotten by the Spirit of God. Now we are not born again. So it should be, you know, read begotten everywhere. We have seen in the uh, first John that it says rightly, the rendering is begotten. And I'm just going to give you the list of scriptures where it is, there is a mistranslation from the old King James and other translators who instead of begotten plays born again. I'll just list them. I don't need to go through, through those things. You can indeed check those uh, verses if you wish for yourself. And those verses are in 1 John chapter 2 verse 29. Also in 1 John chapter 3 verse 9, which we read, in American Standard Version, it says, uh, as it should be, begotten. Also in 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. And also in 1 John chapter 5, verses 1 through 4, and also verse 18. Okay, in those scriptures, there is the wrong, there is a mistranslation, which should be, you know, instead of, instead of saying born again, it should be begotten, because in the original Greek language, it says begotten. However, we do need to be born again, because otherwise we will not be able to inherit the kingdom of God. In the Gospel of John, chapter 3, we have that famous uh, conversation between Nicodemus and Jesus Christ. And I think perhaps if I have, a long time ago I've heard a good message, brethren, which does link even that conversation, even with the ancient house of Israel, and how they've been scattered and lost, and how they need to come back to their father and be born again in order to inherit the kingdom of God. If I find the notes of that old, uh, uh, well, teachings or message, I may try to deliver them to you because it's a very fascinating thing, something I never thought thought about because, yes, among those people who are uh, uh, who are not in the continuing church of God, there are people who, you know, deal much with the uh, house of Israel and the lost ten tribes. There's some very valuable information there that we can also uh, at least analyze. Uh, somebody would say, may I say, well, it's not a matter of salvation. Well, it may, it's not a matter of salvation. But again, 
it is a matter of having the key of David because the Philadelphia church has the key of David. And therefore, having the key of David mean, means that we do understand the uh, identity of the house of Israel. It does mean that we do have a full understanding of the implications of Israel and the we do also understand that God has indeed or has tried, but let's say he will be using the remnant of the house of Israel for the salvation of mankind. So therefore there is a place for the house of Israel and understanding in our minds and uh, we should be happy about it, of course. You know, uh, perhaps understanding all the little details is not a matter of salvation. Yes, I would agree with that. However, it's interesting, it's interesting from the point of understanding the word of God and the plan and the part of Israel that Israel does play in that plan. So in, uh, in uh, chapter three of, of John, uh, and we are going to be reading now, um, we're going to be read verse, reading verse five through eight. We see that interesting conversation. And Jesus answered to Nicodemus, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except one be born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto you, you must be born anew. The wind blows where it will, and you hear the voice thereof, but know not whence it comes and where it goes. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. And then Nicodemus now answers him and says, you know, how can these things be and so on. But you see, we need to be born again uh, in order to inherit the kingdom of God. Because we know that the flesh and blood cannot inherit <laughs> the kingdom of God. That's what it says very clearly in the Bible. Therefore, we must be in our glorified spiritual bodies, just like Jesus Christ is now and will be, as it says in First John, we are going to see him as he is. Well, when we are going to be born again, our state will, will be as described in the Gospel of John chapter 4 and verse 24. Uh, John 4 and verse 24 says, God is a spirit. Uh, Jesus Christ replies to the Samaritan woman. And they that worship him must worship in spirit and truth. So, you know, God is spirit. Of course, in the meantime, as we have the spirit of God, we just worship him in spirit and truth. And one of these days we'll be just like him, we'll be born of him because what is born of flesh is flesh. And what is born of spirit is spirit. And I, I'm just very amazed that people cannot really grasp the concept of God family. You know, it just it amazes me because uh, the logic escapes me. How can they not see God as a family? Because, you know, uh, every kind of animal gives birth to its own kind. Humans give birth to humans. But, you know, if God is going to have his children, then his children must be what? Well, they have to be gods, you know. But to many people, that's a blasphemy because they don't grasp that concept. So uh, God is a spirit and uh, we have to be in the spirit. The same is said in First John uh, chapter 3 uh, that I alluded to just a minute ago. First John chapter 3, you know, that... Uh, we are going to see Jesus Christ as he is when we are going to be in born again. First John chapter 3 verse 1, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called children of God. And such we are. For this cause the world knows us not because it knew him not. And then verse 2, Beloved, now we are children of God. It is not yet made manifest what we shall be. But we know that if he shall be manifested. We shall be like him, for we shall see him even as he is. Well, if we are going to be like him, brethren, what is he? Well, he is the word that was with God, you know, and uh, and was always has always been with God and was with God before. It just humbled itself or himself, you know, to take upon himself a human flesh. But he is God. And if he is God, then we shall be like him, you know, as clearly as that. So we have to be God's nothing, nothing more, nothing else. Now, he himself, Christ, is the firstborn. We know that from Romans 1, 4, but let's just check it there, just that you can update your, uh, update your notes as well, so that you'll be sure. So it's in Romans, uh, chapter 1, and it should be in verse 4, which says that, who has declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead, 
even Jesus Christ, our Lord. So he is born again because he was raised from the dead. He is resurrected from dead. The same also in Romans chapter 8. And in verse 29, we find that he is the first among many brethren, right? Romans 8 verse 29. For whom he foreknew, he also foreordained to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So he is born again. He is now the, the only one that has been so far born again. And the rest of us should follow very soon. And also in Colossians, we find that Jesus Christ is uh, born again. Colossians chapter 1. In Colossians chapter 1 and in verse 15, we are reading the following. Who is the image of the invisible, speaking of Jesus Christ and his preeminence, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation? For in him were all things created in the heavens and upon the earth, things visible and things invisible, of course, meaning angels, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things have been created through him and unto him, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Indeed, so he is the firstborn, as we have already read in Romans, and he is now waiting for many others to come and follow him. How are we to be born again? We have just read about that in Romans chapter 1 and in verse 4. And when are we going to be born again? Well, in the famous resurrection chapter, that is in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we have a detailed account. Keep in mind also that it speaks of the resurrection of Christ, who is the first one. Then come, then we will come uh, after him, but all the dead who are already now dead in Christ, they'll rise even before us. Those who will be a living, they will be transformed in a twinkling of an eye. And what is interesting is that this very uh, epistle of of, uh, of First Corinthians was written also in refutation of various Gnostic ideas. Uh, therefore, brethren, when you read in this chapter, chapter 15, that there are those who said that the resurrection already happened, those were one of those Gnostic ideas, and therefore you should not be baffled. So the Apostle Paul, basically, as well as the first uh, century New Testament writers, were encountering uh, horrible heresies from Gnosticism, and indeed they were uh, uh, battling with Gnostic ideas, very successfully though. However, you know, by the end of the first century, at, at the very end of the life of the last Apostle of Jesus Christ, John, we could see how the Gnostic ideas subtly intruded and crept into the original church and subverted it from within. And therefore, you know, then uh, in the second century, we all of a sudden have no account of uh, the true church, you know, uh, being vital and being so strong as it was. And then all of a sudden when the Christian, so-called Christian church appears on the world scene, we see something totally different. Anyway, the uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the Apostle Paul is again, so he's speaking now about the resurrection, coming resurrection, how we will be born again. He speaks about, you know, when, so he speaks about the resurrection, when we are resurrected, because Gnostics were already having all kinds of strange ideas. Verse 1, No, I make I make known unto you, brethren, the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you received, wherein also you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached unto you, except you believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which also I received. And where did he receive it, Frederick? From whom did he receive that? Again, I have to remind you in Second Corinthians, the Apostle Paul speaks about a man who went to the third heaven. I think that's chapter, I can't remember whether it's chapter 11 or... But in any case, he speaks in, uh, uh, I think it's in chapter 11 in Second Corinthians. But in any way, in, in Second Corinthians, you'll find he speaks about the man. He knows a man who went to the third heaven and heard things unspeakable and so on. That, that man was him. So, you know, he was not among the 12 original apostles and therefore he was directly called by Jesus Christ, resurrected Jesus Christ, who called him from heaven. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? 
And then, of course, Jesus Christ taught him directly because he was envisioned in the third heaven and he was directly taught by Jesus Christ. And this is what he received. You see, none of those Corinthians, they received it from him, even though, even, the, even, even so, they're so boastful and so prideful and so full of themselves as if they were having some special revelations. That was, brethren, the Gnostic, sadly, the Gnostic ideas. Having a special revelation, a special enlightenment that comes to a uh, uh, dead, uh, uh, sleepy soul in you, the spark, you know, that spark is still there, and then a special revelation comes to you, and then you become enlightened, and then you can just uh, join in with that enlightenment to ethereal kind of, uh, ethereal kind of notion of God, and so on, and go to heaven and become part of that ethereal uh, so-called perfection. Those were the crazy Gnostic ideas, brethren, that denied flesh completely. That's why you had asceticism and all kinds of things. So when you read some of these verses in the Bible, you may wonder why in the world is the Apostle Paul mentioning something like that? Well, he's mentioning that because of the crazy Gnostic ideas. And those crazy Gnostic ideas are pretty much present in the modern day in churchianity. They're pretty much present and uh, they are believed to be Christian or Bible-based ideas, when in fact they're totally opposite to the Bible. So, uh, he delivered to them, verse 3, what he received directly from Jesus Christ, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, that, that, that he has been raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. And uh, we know that from the Bible as well. And we know that he was not risen on Sunday morning. No way. There is no way he could be risen. He rose on the third day after he, after being buried in, in the grave. Verse five, and he, that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain until now, but some are fallen asleep. In other words, in other words, Corinthians, you've got plenty of witnesses that Jesus Christ was in the flesh, that he died in the flesh, he rose from the dead, he spoke to those of the brethren, and if you don't believe me, there are plenty of witnesses, about 500 of those that you can always refer to and ask. Then he appears to, to James, then to all the apostles. And last of all, as to the child untimely born, he appeared to me also, verse 8. Verse 9, for I am the least of the apostles that I am not that I am not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which he was bestowed upon me, was not found in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Whether then it be I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. And now he continues to tell them what they believed, that which they preached. Verse 12. Now if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? Those are one, That's one of those crazy Gnostic ideas, brethren. You see, that's why he writes about that. But if there is no resurrection of the dead, neither has Christ been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then is our preaching vain and your faith is also in vain. Yeah, and we are all found false witnesses of God. Because we witnessed of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, neither has Jesus Christ been risen. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is in vain, you are yet in your sins. Then they also that are fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If we have only hoped in Christ in this life, we are of all men most pitiable. But now has Christ been raised from the dead, the first fruits of them that are asleep, for since by men came death, by men also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. You see, in the future sense, brethren, it doesn't say that they'll be alive, born again or now. They shall be more made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, then they that are Christ at his coming. Then comes the end. When he shall deliver up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have abolished all rule and all authority and power. Uh, so, you see, and then let's go to the resurrection of the body, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 35. Resurrection of body, brother, because, you know, the Gnostics, again, denied flesh. 
they were, you know, some of them, you had like two, uh, two wings of Gnosticism. One wing was strictly ascetic. You know, uh, denying yourself food and water and kind of tormenting your flesh because it's so sinful. You find that sadly today among the monks of the Orthodox and Catholic religions. Those people, brethren, don't even sleep properly. They barely eat. Uh, and in the Orthodox tradition, some of them don't even bathe. You know, because they deny their flesh. They try to deny their flesh. I mean, you, you can just imagine how terrible that is. So that was one wing of Gnosticism. Uh, strict asceticism, you know. The other wing was the other way around. It was, you know, a total liberalism. Because flesh doesn't matter, so no matter what we do in the flesh, we will be saved anyway. Because we have been enlightened from from the above. And our spark, the spark of life that was asleep, dormant in us, has now been enlightened. And now, by that spark that has lit up, now we are connected to the, you know, heavenly paradise, to that ethereal kind of idea of God somewhere there up, you know, above the heavenly spheres. And now, you know, since we, there is nothing of this flesh that, that can affect us, we don't care. We can do whatever we want to do with the flesh, it doesn't affect our salvation. That was the other wing of Gnosticism. One way or the other, crazy ideas, brethren. Totally unbiblical ideas. So, First Corinthians 15 and verse 35. But someone will say, How are the dead raised? And with what manner of body do they come? You foolish one, that which you yourself sowest is not quickened except it die. And that which you sow, you sow not the body that shall be, but a bare grain. It may chance of wheat or of some other kind, but God gives it a body even as it pleased him, and to each seed a body of its own. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one flesh of men and another flesh of beasts, and another flesh of birds and another of fishes. Fishes, it says here in the American Standard Version, even though we know that <laughs> the plural of fish is still fish in English. And sometimes you may wonder why the foreigners are so baffled by your grammar. Well, you see, because of that. Because you have sheep and sheep, you know, both singular and plural, fish and fish, singular and plural. Then you have all kinds of uh, nouns that can be also verbs at the same time. So, yeah, sometimes we are baffled. Some of us are baffled when we encounter your <laughs> grammar. Uh, verse 40, there are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial, but the glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon and another glory of the stars, for one star differs from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So also it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. How bait that is not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, then that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthly. The second man is of heaven. As is the earthly, such are they also that are earthly. And as it is heavenly, such are they uh, also that are heavenly. And as we have be, have been born, the, as, sorry, as we have born, it says, from the verb bear, as we have born the image of the earthly, so we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither does corruption inherit incorruption. We have read that in uh, John chapter 3 when Jesus Christ said, you know, flesh and blood, you know, cannot enter into the eternal life. So, you know, you have to be born anew. You have to be born again. Verse 51, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We all shall not sleep, but we all shall be changed. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the last trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, the dead in Christ, of course, and we shall be changed. 
For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. But when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks to be, be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, be you steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Well, indeed, brethren, the labor is not in vain. And let's read as the conclusion, uh, when we will be resurrected, when we will be born again, we will be born again, as Philippians tell us, Philippians chapter 3, Again, you know, the return of Jesus Christ. Philippians chapter 3. And in verse 20, I think it speaks that our citizenship is now in heaven. I think that's that verse. Or it's, yes, exactly, that's that verse. Well, you see the memory scriptures that we had, you know, sometimes do very great service to us. Because sometimes I recognize immediately what is the topic of certain scripture. Here we are, Philippians 3.20, for our citizenship is in heaven, from where also we wait for a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall fashion anew the body of our humiliation, that it may be conformed to the body of his glory, according to the working whereby he is able even to subject all things unto himself. In other words, we are going to be, you know, Conformed to the body of his glory. If we are going to be to, to be conformed, we are going to see him as he is. Then we cannot be seeing him as he is in the flesh and blood. Because as you know, he had to manifest himself to the flesh and blood. So that his disciples could see him and touch him and communicate with him. When we are going to see him in the resurrection as he is, then we will be no flesh and blood. We will be exactly as he is in the spiritual body as uh, the Apostle Paul explained in 1 Corinthians 15. There will be spiritual body, heavenly body, celestial body, and yes, we will see him as his will be as his. So brethren, this is again one of those fundamental doctrines that we have just covered. The doctrine of born again. Uh, so much present and so much believed by millions of people today that they are born again, but they are not. The Bible says very clearly that no, we are not now born again. We are going to be born again. The Bible says that now we are only begotten. How do we get begotten, by the way? Well, it was covered in the previous fundamental doctrine. We be become begotten by baptism. Because the Spirit of God does join with the Spirit of man. The Spirit of man in our mind. It, it is our mind that, that is. It is in our brain. So our mind is actually what makes the physical brain and the Spirit of man Together they form our mind. So therefore when at baptism we receive the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit joins with our spirit of man. And therefore then we become a begotten child of God. And as our thoughts and our thinking process get, you know, is being transformed by the Spirit of God, we just keep growing spiritually just as a child would keep growing, growing until the time uh, in mother's womb. And mother is in Galatians uh, symbolically described as the church of God. So therefore we as the children of God, you know, grow in that womb, in the church of God, until the time comes for those children to be born. And they're going to be born, again, not as flesh, but they're going to be born of the spirit. And they are going to be, as Jesus Christ says to Nicodemus, they're going to be born of the spirit. And they're going to be the spirit. They'll be having spiritual bodies. So we are now begotten. There are also mistranslations in the Bible. I've given you the list of scriptures in 1 John where it should read begotten, not born again. We need to be born again. Yes, we know that from the from the words that Jesus Christ spoke to Nicodemus. In that state, we will be in spiritual state, in the spirit. Christ is the firstborn, the Bible teaches us. And the Bible also teaches us how we are to be born again and when we are to be born again. Again, we are going to be born again at Jesus Christ's return when the first resurrection is going to occur. And we will at that time be born of the Spirit. No longer will be flesh and blood.